Douglas Adams would be proud. This is Masks Part 5. There seems to be some confusion over the difference between input sliders and output sliders when it comes to parametric masking. I think I've finally got my head around it, so in this episode we're going to look into how the output sliders differ from the input sliders. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 39 of Understanding Darktable. Big thanks to Todd Pryor. Todd posted a, a link, I guess, on the Darktable unofficial group on Facebook to a PDF that was called outputsliders.pdf, and it was simply a three-page screen capture of part of the discussion on a thread on pixels.us <laughs> where somebody else was explaining how the output sliders differ from the input sliders and how you can use them. So it's a little bit meta, but we're getting there. Just before we start, you'll notice on screen, I've got this little widget running up in the top left-hand corner called Keymon. This is a Linux utility that shows all the keystrokes and mouse movements, like in terms of mouse wheel clicks and uh, left clicks, right clicks, mouse wheel, uh, control, shift, alt. So I'm running that during the screen capture so that as I perform keystrokes, you get to see what I'm doing, just in case I don't happen to mention exactly what I'm up to. All right, so let's dive on into this first image. This is an image of a Banksia flower that I took a couple of years ago on holiday in the middle of winter. And as you can see, we're right back to the original. All I've done is cropped this into a 16 by 9 format. Now let's suppose that I wanted to give the yellow of the flower just a little bit more pop. So I'd probably go to the Color Zones module, grab the color picker, click on the flower. So I get this black line to show me whereabouts in the color spectrum I am for lightness, for saturation, and for hue. I don't want to change the hue, but I might want to boost the saturation a little bit. So I drag this over to here, give this a little bit of a boost. That's probably enough. I'm just going to use my mouse wheel to narrow that down a bit. There we go. And I might lighten it up a little bit as well, just to make it really jump out. There we go. So before and after. Now, at the moment, we've got no blend mode activated. So if we were to look at the mask for this module, it would be affecting every single pixel in the image. But let's say we just wanted to narrow that down. So we'll go back to a parametric mask. And if we turn on the mask, we can see, like I said, every pixel in the image is being affected by this color zones module at the moment. Now, we could maybe choose on hue and just narrow this down to the yellow part of the spectrum, like so. And that's done a pretty good job of getting us just down to the flower, but we are also picking up a lot of the other parts of the image that we still don't want to include. So maybe we could go drawn and parametric and we'll use a ellipse, which we'll just do something like so. Let's just narrow this down a bit. Use my shift key to restrict that. And I've just realized that this is now too good a mask because it hasn't left me where I wanted to go with showing the output sliders. So let's just widen this up a bit like so. So now we're getting a few pixels on the leaves that are included in the mask that we really don't want. Let's say we weren't able to narrow them down using the input sliders, which is where we're currently working. So right now, our mask is just where these yellow pixels are. So everything that's happening in the color zones module is being restricted only to pixels which are yellow in this instance. That is, 
areas that are part of the active mask. So we can turn that off and we can see, again, I'll just turn the module off, that we are now only affecting our Banksia flower. That's great. That's what we wanted. Now, if we wanted to then narrow that mask further, this is where the output sliders come into play. Although this terminology is not used in the Darktable manual, I kind of think of the output sliders as being a feedback loop. Essentially what it's doing is allowing us to have a second crack at narrowing the mask of pixels which are being affected. But by using the state of the image after the, the module in question, which in this case is the Color Zones module, has done its thing. So we're saying, here's our image at, at input, and then we apply a mask, and so that restricts which areas of the image actually get affected by the module. But then at the output stage, after the module's done its thing, we can refine the mask even further. So it's kind of like a feedback loop. I mean, we're not reprocessing the image, but we're narrowing the mask a little bit further based on the output after the module's done its thing. So in order to refine this mask a little further, we might say, well, we know we increased the saturation on the flower. So maybe if we went to the chromacity, which is our saturation, and narrowed the output so that it only affected pixels of a certain level of saturation, maybe we could narrow this mask even further. So if I grab this and bring this up, oh, wow, look at that. Actually, just back that off and bring that up. And look at the job that has done. So we've now got our mask right on the flower, but we've excluded all of those pixels on these green leaves, which were part of the mask at the input stage, but now we've managed to exclude them at the output stage. Now, it's possible we could have done the same thing with the chromacity channel on the input sliders, but I hope this is helping to explain. You know what? We're going to jump to that second image because I know you're dying to see the images of Tegan that I shot through the week. So let's do that. Okay, so as I mentioned at the end of the last episode, I was going to do this autumn colours shoot with Tegan. And the theory was blue wardrobe to contrast against the colour of the leaves. Now, I actually borrowed this red jacket out of my wife's wardrobe uh, because Tegan didn't have any blue jackets and neither did we. And I thought, the, the red might work on its own, and it does, doesn't do too bad a job. But I wanted to see how this would look as a blue jacket. You know, whether my theory of complementary colours would, would hold water. So, I've already done a little bit of retouching on this, as we can see. Filmic, colour zones, local contrast, retouch, white balance, and some soften for her skin. But, we want to make the jacket blue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by duplicating the color zones module and didn't mean to close that. I'm going to rename it blue jacket. And what I'm going to do is again, grab my color picker, pick the jacket. So now we've got our black line on the color zones module and I'm going to go to the hue and I'm going to bring this triangle across to here. Whoa, what just happened on my history stack? That was random. Wow. Whoa, that is trippy. Wow. Compress that. Thank you. 
Wow, I've never seen it do that before. Okay, uh, so anyway, I'm going to use my mouse wheel to narrow down the scope of this node, and we're going to pull it towards blue. And straight away, we're pretty much in the ballpark. We've got our blue jacket. It has infected some of these leaves, which we don't want, and it's made her lips go blue, which is also not what we want. So obviously there is some further refinement required. So let's go for a drawn and parametric mask. And once again, we will see if we turn this on that all pixels in the image are currently being affected, right? So our whole mask is yellow. Turn that off. What I will start with is a very quick mask around the jacket, like so up there between her lips and the jacket and close it off. So now we've got a mask that only affects this area, but doesn't affect the leaves or her face. So that's an improvement, but let's narrow it down even further. Let's go with the hue and because the original state of the hue of these pixels was red. We want to target the reds. We don't want to target the blues, right? The blue is being introduced by the module. We actually want to target the red pixels that were there. So what we'll do is bring our input slider down like so. We'll turn the mask back on so we can see what we're doing here. That's pretty close. Yeah, we'll just, we'll, don't want those pixels to start getting transparent. So that's good. Might just try a little bit of opacity here to sharpen up this mask. What this mask opacity slider does is essentially introduce an S curve to the mask values. Not to the pixels underneath, but to the actual mask itself. So they help to sharpen up the mask. Uh, and the contrast does something similar, but I really haven't quite got my head around that one just yet. Let's just introduce a little bit of blur and feather. And that's done a pretty good job. We're still getting a little bit of the leaves there, but that's not the end of the world because it's only a couple of leaves in the scheme of a you know, a couple of thousand leaves. So let's just turn that off. Let's jump on in. Oh, I hate when I do that. This is when you absolutely... So what I did there, for those who weren't watching, was I used my mouse wheel, but because my mouse was inside the mask, it resized the mask. And the best defense against this is to control click this little icon here, the show and edit mask elements. What that does, although there is no visual indication to tell you, is put you in what's called restricted edit mode. I did mention this back in the uh, original episode on parametric masks, which would have been about episode 15 or 16 at a guess. So what happens now is I can zoom the image and not resize the mask. And you'll see that I cannot click and drag to move the mask either. It's actually protected in both its size and its position. You can still mouse over a node and reposition a node and, you know, all the other things that go along with that, like changing the, the, sh the size of the feather by grabbing those nodes, all that sort of stuff you can still do, but you can't move or resize the mask. Okay. So now what I wanted to do was to zoom in and have a look at the red. I've actually done a pretty good job there. There's a little bit of red, you know, bleeding in around the hair, around the edges of the leaves here. But by and large, done a pretty good job of, of getting just the blues. So what else do I need to do? Really not much. That's, that's given me the blue jacket that I wanted. What I could perhaps do to try and exclude those leaves is maybe 
grab the color picker, click on that. And as we can see on the output slider, it's right down there in the reds. So let's, nope, that would be a big no from the judges. Although, if we did this so that we are just getting the leaves, because we're not picking up any of the jacket at this point in time, if we now invert that, oh, nice, nice. Still got a little bit down here, uh, but we certainly got rid of those leaves up there. I'm pretty impressed with that. So if we turn our mask off, there we go. That's, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I think, you know, that's done a pretty good job of recoloring the jacket without affecting anything else in the image. So if we were to jump back to this earlier state, well, we'll go right back to the soften and we've got our red jacket back. And as you can see, we've recolored the jacket without affecting the leaves and without affecting any skin tone. That's pretty cool. Pretty impressed with that. The other thing I was thinking of, and I might just close that, and I'm going to do another duplicate color zone module, and I will rename this Yellow Leaves. So let's suppose that in order to accentuate the contrasting colors thing, we want to make those leaves a little bit more yellow, and maybe we want to lighten them up. So we'll go Hue. We'll grab one of these leaves and just again use my mouse wheel to narrow down that area. And we're just going to, ooh, maybe gone a little bit too far there. Yeah, maybe there. That's not bad. And let's just lighten them up a little bit as well. Nice. Now, again, at the moment, we are affecting every pixel in the image. Now, sure, we've targeted a fairly specific part of the color range, but some of our skin tones probably fall within that range. So let's try and narrow that down. We'll go drawn and parametric masks again. I might immediately start just by drawing a quick mask inside Tegan and we'll close that off. And then I will invert that mask because obviously, you know, at the moment, you're not seeing it. I'll just turn the mask on. At the moment, we're only picking up Tegan. We actually want the opposite of that. So we will click on the little polarity toggle button there beside drawn masks and that will reverse that and I might just reposition that so we get her face out of the masked area. I'm just realizing that I really wanted to bring this mask inside of Tegan so that we pick up everything that's on the outside so I can bring that mask in and the parametric mask will pick up the hard edges for us. So yeah, I think we're pretty much there. You know, I've just had to stop for five minutes and try and collect my thoughts because when I was preparing to record this video, I was doing some testing on this image and I had something in mind where I was going to use the output sliders, but now I kind of feel like I've pretty much got that mask to where I wanted it to be for the yellow leaves just using the input sliders. But hopefully I have explained so far the idea that the output sliders give you an opportunity to further refine the mask and again, you know, based on either the luminosity, the A channel or B channel in the lab color mode, the chromacity, which is your saturation, or hue, which is your color information, or any combination thereof, at the output stage, after 
whatever module you're working in has done its thing. Now, in that PDF that Todd linked to, and again, like I said, the link will be in the comments down below or in the description down below. The original discussion was all about extremes of exposure adjustment in the exposure module, where values that existed at the input stage of the module were radically shifted at the output stage of the module, and therefore the output sliders gave an opportunity to refine the mask in ways that you couldn't with the input sliders because of the extreme nature of the adjustment happening in between input and output. So maybe that's what it comes down to. Maybe it's all about the extremes of the processing that you employ in any given module. So I'm going to leave that there. Uh, as far as this episode goes, I hope that's been helpful. If you have had experience using the output sliders in some other way or can further add to this conversation, please sing out in the comments down below for the benefit of everybody else. That's pretty much it for what I wanted to cover. Uh, a couple other things. The shoot with Tegan went really well. Uh, we were out at 7.30 in the morning got a little bit of stuff done before the sun came up and so we got some really nice soft light images uh, and then once the sun came up you know got rid of the soft box went with bare flash and uh, you know used hard sun and hard flash together and got some more contrasty stuff uh, I'm not going to show you all of those images right now because I figure over the following you know three or four episodes I'll be able to use some more of those images as sample images uh, to work with uh, she's really happy with the images that we shot. I was glad to get out and do a shoot again. It was great. It felt like it had been a while since I'd done that. And I'm actually organizing another shoot that I, I threw to her. I said, you know, are you interested in this idea? And we're going to try and do it in the next couple of weeks before it gets stupidly cold because we are heading into winter here in Australia. And obviously, middle of June will be the... Um, the the winter solstice which will be the shortest day and of course after that that's when it will re get really cold and this particular shoot will require tegan to be waist deep in mud and <laughs> me probably knee deep in the mud uh so it's going to be chilly and but it should be an interesting shoot i won't tell you any more about it just yet um of course it's going to be awful if it doesn't come to fruition because i've set it all up and not let you in on the details so i'll have to make sure i carry it through all right um there has in the last two to three weeks been a massive spike in uh, subscriber numbers and in watched minutes i don't know someone commented last week about uh maybe it was due to adobe's supposedly oh we're testing things on the website but that testing implied that there was about to be a massive hike in the price of the monthly subscription for Creative Cloud. And so maybe, you know, there is a a massive quantity of people who are now looking for alternatives to Lightroom uh, who have discovered Darktable and are maybe headed in this direction. If that is the case, if you are one of the new Adobe refugees, welcome aboard. Glad to have you here. And if my videos have been helpful to you, fantastic. Glad that that has been the case. Thank you for subscribing. And to my Patreon supporters, once again, thank you for your support. That is always most welcome and uh, appreciated. All right. I think that pretty much does it for this episode. I will see you in the next one.